Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining. I'm going to give it a minute or so as people uh, pile in to the show. We've got about 90 attendees, and I suspect there'll be a lot more. So I'm going to give this another minute or so before we begin. All right, I'm going to start the show now. It's about one minute after. There are some people coming in, but I want to start promptly and on time for those who are attending. Um, my name is David Sandbank, and good afternoon to everyone. I'm the Vice President of Distributed Energy Resources at NYSERDA, and I really want to thank everybody for joining. The future of New York commercial, industrial, and community distributed generation solar markets technical conference day one. Uh, I will have a special thanks to Department of Public Service for uh, co, uh, you know, joining this event with NYSERDA. Um, so that's great. Also, I have a special thank you to John Howard, the chair of the Public Service Commission, as well as Doreen Harris, the president of NYSERDA, who's joining us for this conference and is going to uh, providing opening remarks. So it'll be a good kickoff for us. Uh, if you could advance to the next slide, please. All right, so again, this, my name is David Sandbank, and I wanna make sure that um, we all understand the goal of this conference today. And the goal of this conference really is to get everyone up to speed on distributed commercial industrial solar and community solar. The market, get up to date on the market, you know, uh, to where we got to today. So what it's gonna require is a little bit of a look back at the beginning, which I'll be presenting. And then the second half of the presentation is, well, what do we do next? Um, so that that is my goal today to get everybody on the same page. Um, so we're going to be presenting a fair amount to you today, um, a narrative with data and charts, um, and then we're going to have a second technical conference uh, day two, which is going to be on May 7th, where stakeholders will have the opportunity to give response presentations and provide us with feedback. Um, I also want to mention that for those of you who are unable to present on May 7th, that there's going to be an informal comment period uh, following today's technical conference. So we'll be able to really hear everyone's uh, feedback. Uh, so don't uh, feel nervous if, if you're unable to present on May 7th. We're going to hear everybody's feedback. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so on this technical conference, we have a fair amount of state representatives, both from Department of Public Service and NYSERDA. And I thought I'd put uh, the names down here so you can see who they are. Not everybody here is gonna be presenting, but everybody here is going to be available at the Q&A section at the end of the conference. So um, we have a great team here with a lot of knowledge. Uh, we'll probably be, be able to answer a lot of your questions. Um, and um, I want to thank everybody on the staff for Department of Public Service and NYSERDA for joining us here today as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so logistics are important. And what I'd like to do is talk about how you can ask questions. Uh, there is a Q&A a Q&A portion on the WebEx. You, when you have a question, please type that out in the QA, Q&A. Um, nobody else will see your questions, however, we will, and we will get to those questions at the end. So we're going to aggregate all those questions and answer as many as we can at the end. You can ask those questions throughout the presentation. You do not have to wait till the end. Uh, so if I say something or someone else says something and you have a question, just chat it on down and we'll uh, aggregate it and get to it at the end. And if you have any technical problems, um, Karen Fusco uh, at NYSERDA, you see her email right there. Uh, she is a fantastic events presenter and can walk you through any types of problems you might have. And hopefully there aren't many. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so this is the agenda we have today. Um, 
we have opening remarks, as I mentioned earlier, and then we're going to talk about the focus and scope of this technical conference and the and um, the conferences that uh, come after that. Really, what are we all talking about and what are we not talking about? Um, this is number three um, is is a series of slides in the commercial industrial and CDG solar market progress to date. It's going to cover from 2014 to 2020 and it's all going to catch us up to speed on how we got to a thriving uh, industry here in New York State. Um, and then number four, Luke Forrester on our team, I'm sure a lot of you have him on speed dial for VDR questions and value stack questions, is going to run us through a slide on project economics and use cases. Um, and then Carl Moss from, from our team is going to uh, bring us to the end, discuss what are the benefits of distributed solar, um, talk, uh, talk us through establishing a value of carbon. Um, and then um, really one of the most important parts of this presentation, which is the options for the post six gigawatt commercial industrial and community solar project support. Like where do we go from here uh, above and beyond the six gigawatt mandate? Then we're gonna have next steps. So that'll have some information for you on what we're doing next, followed by a Q&A. So what I'd like to do is go to the next slide and introduce our president, President of NYSERDA. I'm sure a lot of you know who she is, Doreen Harris. Doreen, if you could please unmute, that would be great. And uh, take us through this slide and hand it off to John, Chair Chairman um, John Howard, please, when you're done. Great. Uh, thank you, David, and good afternoon, everyone. Again, I'm Doreen Harris, the President and CEO of NYSERDA. Uh, thank you all for joining us today for this important conversation. Uh, I, would too, would like to thank Public Service Commission Chair John Howard and the entire staff of the Department of Public Service for hosting this conference with us. Um, as, as David described, it is intended to kick off discussions as we explore options and pathways forward to ensuring a sustainable future for the state's distributed solar market toward the ambitious goals established by Governor Cuomo under the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. There is a lot to be proud of about what we've built together, and I'd like to take a few moments to look back at the trajectory that has brought us here today and highlight some of our successes as we look toward the future. New York has demonstrated that we are taking seriously the realization of the goals and benefits described in the Climate Act. And today, we are at 87% of our six gigawatt distributed solar goal for 2025 with 2,800 megawatts completed statewide and another 2,400 megawatts in the pipeline. So adding those numbers up, I think we can conclude that not only are we well on our way to reaching the six gigawatt goal, but indeed ahead of schedule. So I'm happy to say that together we have built a thriving market here in New York and with our success accelerating beyond what we'd even expected, we have positioned New York State collectively as one of the fastest growing solar markets in the nation with tremendous growth in community solar projects leading the way. And despite the COVID-19 pandemic, 2020 was our best year yet with 539 megawatts of distributed solar deployed statewide. According to Wood Mackenzie's latest U.S. Solar Market Insights report for 2020, New York is second in the nation for distributed solar deployment. Uh, New York was number one in community solar for 2020 and number two in the nation in all time community solar deployment. Collectively, from 2011 through the end of 2020, New York solar market has grown nearly 1,900%, leveraging $5.3 billion in private investments, fueling more than 12,000 jobs, and decreasing the cost of solar by 68%. But these statistics are exciting because they are more than just numbers in a report. They represent increased access to solar energy for all New Yorkers, a cornerstone of our efforts under the Climate Act. And here in New York, I'm happy to report that we have built a healthy ecosystem to support this resilient and robust distributed solar market from developers, engineering and construction firms, project owners, financiers, tax equity providers, and customer acquisition companies. We all worked together over these years to create a streamlined process to reach the point where we are today. 
And as I said, we have achieved our success together with public-private partnerships. And we have worked very closely with our stakeholders to understand market needs, to know what barriers we need to tackle together while keeping our eye on the changing landscape in order to achieve our goals in the most aggressive and fiscally responsible manner. While building out solar deployment, we have worked hard to make sure that projects are supporting the needs of the state's electric grid as a whole, so all New Yorkers can benefit. We saw this exemplified by the value of distributed energy resources or VEDER tariff, which aims to create a more efficient, reliable, and consumer-oriented system. VEDER has proven to be quite successful uh, in providing price signals for solar projects to inject electricity into the grid when and where it is needed the most. And the New York Sun program has proven to be a nimble and critical policy tool to jumpstart this market, along with our collective work to address barriers and cut soft costs in every facet of this industry. And I'd be remiss if I didn't also highlight the critical role the New York Green Bank has played in supporting this market. Over these years, we have seen private lenders become more comfortable with supporting residential and community solar sectors that were once considered risky for financing and capital, capital was difficult to come by for developers. But times have certainly changed. Since its inception, New York Green Bank has committed $1.2 billion across 82 transactions. And this includes the execution of 41 community solar and residential solar transactions, committing over 700 million and supporting hundreds of community solar projects and tens of thousands of residential solar projects as well. So we have together so much to be proud of for sure as we reflect on the past decade of progress. And this is the mindset we intend to keep as we now seek a pathway forward in what we are calling our post six gigawatt world. I think we can agree that the global, federal and statewide context associated with distributed solar is quite different now than it was in the early days of New York's policy development. In addition to continuing to build on our own successes, there are also promising federal tailwinds we could leverage as we chart our way forward. And we now have a mature, robust market as our starting point. So it's time for us together to collectively roll up our sleeves to identify and scrutinize refreshed approaches, which can responsibly and cost-effectively sustain and grow the market that we have built together. So I see today as a prime opportunity to begin to explore those critical components necessary to realize the future we envision. So I want to thank you in advance for participating throughout this process, and we very much look forward to hearing your perspectives. And with that, I will turn the webinar over to Chair Howard with my thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, as Doreen described, you've certainly made great progress. And for those who were there at the nascent parts of this effort, and one might even say unbelievable progress since our early days of experimenting with net metering. Community distributed generation in particular, community solar is one important part New York's diversified portfolio of clean energy initiatives. And quite honestly, as evidenced by Doreen's remarks, probably one of our most successful efforts to date. As we will hear today, our efforts have established a reliable investment environment for community solar development, helped to significantly drive down the cost of these projects. Current New York Sun issue of funding is expected to achieve the CLCPA's six gigawatt goal well ahead of its target date. Something that uh, when established, no one probably would have believed. These successes have add, been aided in no small way by a great collaboration. I would say extraordinary collaboration seen among stakeholders in our CEG and VEDER proceedings. The question today is what's next? This portion of the clean energy portfolio. I hope and expectations is that it will continue on the success as we plan to develop thoughtful options for the commission to consider. As always, it is critical that costs to abate carbon emissions continue to be driven down. 
that proposals continue to recognize balance that must be struck the fund by funding critical programs and consumer rate relief. So that all New Yorkers that we represent will see value in their these policies. And that thank you again and really look forward to everyone's earnest commitment to achieving our goal today and in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, both of you, um, Doreen and, and Chairman John Howard, because um, the words that you're talking about really exemplify uh, the meaningful impact of community solar in the commercial industrial industry uh, that we have thus far in, 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 in New York State. And I'm really excited to go through the next part of this presentation for those of you who don't completely understand what we're talking about to run you through how we got to where we are today. But prior to doing that, uh, I would like to say uh, we're probably going to get a lot of questions of is this presentation and recording going to be available afterwards? And yes, it will be uh, most likely both on the uh, Department of Public Service website, the DMM site, as well as NYSERDA's New York Sun website. So we will make it available on both. And we'll send an email announcement out to, to those attendees here on uh, when that is available for you. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. I would also like to start with the focus and scope of this presentation. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So what this conversation really is about, it's about number one, commercial and industrial and community solar project in that industry and moving forwards. Uh, but it's not about the New York Sun target of hitting six gigawatts, because as you heard Doreen open up with, we're on track to to hit that target um, and, and maybe even hit it early. Um, right now, you could see this chart. This is, I believe, as the end uh, at the end of 2020, that we're well on track to achieve the six gigawatt target. Uh, most likely before 2025, and do so with the amount of money that we have already allocated for the New York Sun program. As you can see uh, on the bottom chart, the, the, to the bottom bar, the total, uh, the dark blue represents how many projects we've completed thus far. And um, if you heard um, Doreen say it's, it's about 2.8 gigawatts of projects. And the lighter blue uh, portion of the bar is what's in the New York Sun pipeline, you know, and that, that's uh, about two and a half gigawatts. So when you add the two together, we're 88% of the way there. So that orange section of, of the bar is, is what we have to cover next. And uh, you can clearly see that in the orange section is 692 megawatts. Um, you can clearly see that a huge portion of, of these projects are megawatt, large megawatt scale projects. Uh, most of them are really community solar projects. When you look at community solar, it's about 60% of this total six gigawatt target. So it's really been a very robust program. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, um, this is uh, a continuation of what we're going to talk about. You can see that the benefits of distributed solar uh, we're going to get to, and Carl will cover that, you know, uh, about why would we consider con continuing uh, distributed solar market uh, beyond the six gigawatt. And if we decide to do that, and what would the road be, what is the potential scale and scope of that future? Uh, how would things like hosting capacity become barriers or helpful uh, in determining what the new number could be? Uh, what kind of transmission impact uh, for future development. Obviously, a lot on people's minds is the DEC guidance on the value of carbon and the potential effect on the E value. Again, my colleague, Carl, Mar Carl Moss, will, <laughs> will be covering that. And, you know, we have the role, uh, what is the possible new role of distributed solar in the clean energy standard 70% renewable by 2030 if it goes beyond six gigawatts? Um, 
obviously anything we do right now with the Climate Act uh, has a major focus on disadvantaged community requirements, and that needs to be considered in any potential outcome that is derived. And we also have to look at, you know, who's the new White House and the federal tailwinds that we might see coming our way with the investment tax credit get um, extended and what other, uh, you know, opportunities on the federal side could we leverage in moving forwards. Um, what state initiatives must be considered? Those are options or platforms in which we would move forwards uh, in any potential manner. And goals beyond six gigawatt in an equitable cost allocation. Would there be uh, different uh, regional uh, goals, utility goals? Um, you know, so that that has to be taken into consideration. Topics outside of the scope here, where we're really it's not a rooftop residential, um, you know, topic. It's not rooftop commercial topic. It's not the large scale renewable uh, projects that we're talking about that are much larger than five megawatts. Um, we're strictly talking about solar for now, so it does not include other technologies. And this isn't a platform to discuss continuation of community credit. We're aware there are some petitions um, that have been filed about that. And this is, uh, that is a very important topic, but this isn't a particular platform to discuss that. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Great, thank you. Um, this series of slides that I was talking about earlier from 2014 to 2020 really demonstrates to me the true public-private partnership work that we've done in New York that I'm quite proud of. We've worked together uh, to really understand the issues from so many different levels, ratepayer impact, solar developer barriers, local government concerns, and we've come up with solutions together along the way. And that's really going to be evidenced by the total drop in cost of solar and the incentives that you're going to see throughout these slides. Next slide, please. Great, so this is 2014. In 2014, New York Sun launched its um, commercial industrial megawatt block uh, for projects or in or residential projects actually. Um, we set forth a soft cost reduction set in place. That soft cost reduction it was what I was talking about from the start. How do we reduce barriers for developers and aid local government with incoming solar projects and really in coming up with the soft cost initiative, we went from reactive mode to proactive mode. How do we get to a point where we could see the pipeline, see where it's coming and get ahead of it and help those local governments to make decisions? And I'll get much more into that uh, later. And prior to um, the megawatt block, uh, there was uh, a competitive bid program. So we had uh, built some capacity up to the megawatt block starting, but not a lot. And as you can see here on the on uh, below, uh, right now in annual non-residential PV completions, we're number fifth in the nation in 2014. We'll keep an eye on that as we advance slides. When you look over to the right, when we're looking about how many megawatts of commercial industrial projects have we installed in this one year, 2014, you can see it's about 27 uh, megawatts. The yellow is how many, uh, how expensive those projects were. So obviously for those that you don't know, that don't know, projects are, uh, the project cost is measured in cost per watt. And so this is $2.75 per watt is what the average project costs. And then you could see a, a faded number below that 83 cents. That was the typical NYSERDA incentive at that time in New York, in the New York Sun program. So you can see the cost was 275 and the incentive was 83 cents. I really have to stress that in this slide and all the following slide, this these charts only show the NYSERDA incentive per watt, the New York Sun incentive. This doesn't include federal tax credits. It doesn't include any tariff-based incentives like the MTC or community credit or community adder. This is the base incentive that you got from uh, NYSERDA and or New York Sun. Could we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so in 2015, um, we did launch the commercial industrial megawatt block. As I mentioned earlier in 2014, it started out with residential only. 
And um, the, the reason why the megawatt block is so important is number one, it's a declining block. So it uh, decreases the incentive over time. But what it does is it provides certainty and transparency to a market. And when certainty and transparency are provided to the market, it draws in um, developers, financiers, aggregators, and all the different steps along the way of people who have to get a project from A to Z and brings them and tracks them into the state because it's a known uh, amount of money and a known amount of time for the most part of how many, how long those incentives will be here. So many other states have boom and bust and it really doesn't work. And the beauty of the megawatt block program is it avoids that boom and bust. As you can see here, um, the cost went from 275 for a, a project down to $2.55 and our incentive went down slightly, 83 cents to 77 cents. Um, but one of the highlights of 2015 was uh, community solar and what we call community distributed generation because it's not just solar. Um, order makes uh, makes it possible. So that order was approved in 2015. And now we are number three in annual uh, non residential PV completions in the nation. So let's go to the next slide, please. Great, thank you. So in 2016, you can see that um, we have the first two CDG projects are completed in the state. On the 2016 bar, you can see a slight sliver at the bottom that's dark blue. And that slight sliver represents the community solar portion of projects that are being built in the state. Everything else is non-community solar projects. So you could see it's starting to take a foothold. And you could also see that the uh, we still have the prices coming down slightly uh, on the project side and on the incentive slide um, coming down quite a bit, down to 44 cents. Um, some of the standouts during 2016 um, was the uh, working together uh, to get the value of distributed energy resource tariff out. Uh, it was a long process, a first of its kind process that you know is is uh, something that that has laid the the foundation for a lot of future projects. So I'm going to get into that a little later. Um, but what we also saw in 2016 was a massive uh, pipeline that was clogged because interconnection did not have really the proper rules and regulations it needs uh, to be able to allow projects to move forwards in a timely manner. So there was a, a, a sort of a gridlock, so to speak, happening in the interconnection queue. Um, you can see now we're number four in annual non-res uh, PV. And um, so that, that pipeline of projects on hold really needed to be cleared and needed a solution, which we're going to get to in, in slides after this. So let's go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So as you can see, 2017 was a big year. Um, it was a big year because VEDER was now adopted. And what, what VEDER did was allow to send the right price signals with time and location grid benefits. And this is really important when we are committing to six gigawatts of solar, knowing a lot of those gigawatts are gonna be larger projects. And if we're gonna deploy that many uh, solar projects and that many megawatts, we really wanna make sure we're deploying it in a manner that makes the grid more efficient and benefits all New Yorkers. And that's what VEDER is all about. It allows to send price signals so that projects are encouraged to inject electricity into the grid when the grid needs it the most. Huge uh, lift for us and really one of America's first time locational sensitive distributed gener generation tariffs. So we, we, we were definitely a pioneer in that uh, area. Another huge mammoth lift was the queue management order uh, that addressed the gridlock I mentioned on the prior slide uh, for interconnection process paved the way for future development. And um, obviously, when you look to the right, you could see, you know, double the amount of capacity in 2017 than 2016. That's not by mistake. That's because of all the hard work um, everybody and a lot of people on this conference put into um, working on uh, VEDER and the value stack, working through the interconnection queue management order um, and, and making that all happen. In addition to that, 
the solar guidebook um, was launched. And this was really the next step uh, in the phase of how does government provide uh, the necessary assistance technically, uh, educationally, not only to local government, to solar developers. Um, and, and we came out with a guidebook with some really key chapters in that. Uh, one of the, the, the biggest chapter that I think was most helpful was the model solar energy law. Uh, that really helped local government um, understand how they can allow projects to come into their community in, in a way that makes them feel comfortable and keeping the character of their own town and not just go into a moratorium and reject the project because they're not sure what it means, but for us to go in there and educate those local government and communities to understand what this means for them and how you can do it in a responsible manner. So the model solar energy law within the solar guidebook was a real success. We also have chapters like permitting and inspecting, solar payment and in lieu of taxes, uh, calculator, so a pilot calculator was so helpful, uh, solar and ag districts, decommissioning, um, as, as, as well as a, a powerful NYSERDA team that would literally travel the state um, from Montauk all the way to Buffalo, meeting in person with local governments and, and helping them talk through uh, what's best for their town's character and how to move forwards in solar. And th this has been a, a real, um, I think you could talk to a lot of solar developers on how much that helped get projects through. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so in 2018, um, I'm going to stick to the right side of the chart first, because there we go again. Uh, we doubled our capacity from 2017 to 2018. You continue to see the downward trajectory of the solar cost uh, down now to $2.05. And you could see the NYSERDA incentive continue to come down as well. And you can see community solar really starting to take a short, a small foothold in the total capacity built that year. Not a lot, but there is uh, the beginnings of the community solar market rearing its head there. And because of that um, doubling of capacity, you can see now we're number two in the state, I'm sorry, number two in the country in non-residential PV installations. And we're going to hold that number two all the way through to 2020. Um, so um, that's a great milestone that we achieved. In doing so, in 2018, we restructured the megawatt block. I think a lot of you uh, were a part of that. Again, the public-private partnership. We had a series of meetings and we, we received so much input. We worked together and figured out how can I sort of best improve our program so that it lowers costs for everybody, including adding uh, new incentives for brownfields, landfills, affordable housing, and in Con Ed territory, um, canopy, uh, rooftop canopy adders and carport adders because the footprint there is so limited. So we decided to encourage people to explore other, uh, you know, um, topographies they can put the solar panels on. Um, so that was a very successful rollout as well. I think um, something else that, oh, another item uh, within the um, redesign was we realized that the solar market was really mature and we didn't have to hold um, our incentive and pay it out over four years. We cut that to two years because we know that these projects are producing energy and it's really all in, within the solar developer's best interest that they produce energy. It's not something we have to monitor. So we um, accelerated our incentive payments, uh, which helped uh, lower their financing costs. So that was another great uh, improvement to the program. Um, so I think that you could see there's two community solar projects completed in New York City as well, uh, which is great. And then the other item which made a gigantic ish, uh, change here, a sea change really, was the SIR was capped at two megawatts AC and it got um, increased to five megawatts AC. And what that did was it brought a lot of economy of scale to projects where they're able to lower their costs. That was a massive improvement. And you'll see the costs of solar projects continue to come down based on everything that I'm talking about and all these uh, barriers that we're trying to uh, remove. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. And again, you can see we're in, um, still number two in annual non-res PV. 
Uh, and on the right hand side, uh, you can see the cost of doing a solar project uh, has come down dramatically. Uh, but look at community solar now. Community solar is a lion's share of the projects that were built in 2019. It looks like about three quarters of the projects. Um, and you could see that our, you know, our incentive was a bit flatlined that that year. Um, so, it, you know, you, obviously everything we're talking about, all the improvements we made, everything we're working on together um, has been working. Um, this is the launch of our PV plus storage program. Dozens of large community solar projects added energy storage to their PV projects, capitalizing on the value stack that could provide the grid energy when it needs it the most. Uh, it was very successful uh, and glad to see that that worked very well. And then a huge improvement to VTER and the value stack. Uh, it really a phase two VTER approach here was, was in 2019. What that did, it just make it easier to finance projects helped reduce the ongoing costs for, to help to reduce the ongoing costs for developers by leveraging anchor tenants and most importantly provided aligned price signals in the value stack which saw a large amount of projects now you start using single access trackers to also provide the grid energy when it needs it the most so it was a, a great success the consolidated billing order helped dramatic dramatically lower ongoing customer acquisition and billing costs for developers for future projects. That was a big one. And obviously in the Climate Act, we set a new goal from three gigawatts to six gigawatts for New York Sun. Um, so obviously uh, that was a shot across the bow of what comes next. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, great. Um, so now we're into 2020. Um, you can see there's a lot that happened here. I'm going to start with uh, on the bottom left. We're still number two in the nation. Um, but now, guess what? We're number one in 2020 for annual CDG completions. And I'll be honest with you, it wasn't close. We were number one by quite a big margin there. And when you look at all community solar, we're number two in the nation. Uh, at the end of 2020, I, that is changing fast, and and I would be fairly confident to say we will be number one in in the in the, I would say uh, in the near future. Um, and then on the right, you know, you could see the trajectory just keeps coming down. Now we're down to a dollar fifty-five per watt. You could see when we started, we were at two seventy-five a watt. Now we're down for a project cost of a dollar fifty-five a watt, and the incentive continues to come down to twenty-nine cents a watt down from 83 cents a watt in 2014. So we're making a lot of progress here. Um, you could see that the community adder was launched uh, in certain uh, territories, utility territories. It's um, a community adder is a New York Sun incentive in lieu of a tariff based incentive. And it's an upfront incentive rather than tied to a kilowatt hour based incentive, which just means that we could use net present value to drive down the ratepayer impacts and, and spend less money on these projects. Um, and we could also uh, look at a, a great improvement uh, uh, to come, which is uh, community choice aggregation is now approved um, to provide um, you know, uh, opt out uh, community solar subscribers uh, subscriptions to community solar projects. So that that is something that is going to continue to lower costs for projects in the future. In 2020, we were able to expand the New York Sun program from three six gigawatt, a uh, three gigawatt goal to six gigawatt goal. Um, by 2025, what we did in short was we added about 1.8 gigawatts of new um, uh, capacity to the commercial industrial rest of state block and we added 135 million dollars for benefits for low to moderate income households and disadvantaged communities um, which is a huge um, achievement and i would say community solar is definitely going to play a large role in that vehicle to provide low income uh, subscribers with um, bill relief through community solar projects so that's great. Um, obviously, 2020 brought some real hardships for everybody because of COVID-19, halted the industry entirely for several months. 
and I really want to compliment the industry because with it was just such a great rebound. I wasn't expecting us to surpass 2019 in deployments, but if you can clearly see in the bar there, we surpassed it, granted by a little bit, but we surpassed it in the year of COVID. So huge shout out to the industry on getting that done. And look, I mean, every project just about in 2020 now in commercial industrial is community solar. So that's self-explanatory. Um, and then you could see that uh, in 2020, the Clean Energy Standard Order laid the pathway for achieving the Climate Act mandate of 70% renewable by 30, 2030. Next slide, please. Okay. And what I'm going to say to everybody is I'm going to get through one or two more slides, and then we're going to take a five-minute break so everybody could um, – take a take a slight break and then i'm going to introduce our next colleague luke forrester so i'm just giving you a heads up that we will be breaking uh, momentarily so this slide is really important it's the decline of community community solar incentives all in so in the prior slides we just saw the new york sun and nicerta incentives values going down over time but if you want to know the total state incentives that went into community solar projects inclusive of the new york sun incentive and um, a, a community, an MTC community credit or community adder. So all in state incentives, you could see it here. And you could see that uh, when we started out in community solar, uh, when we had the MTC tranche one, it was a higher base incentive. Uh, in New York Sun. So uh, these are all by megawatt, right? So it was over a, a million dollars per megawatt of incentives. And when you look and you're coming down to where we are today, which is all the way on the right hand side, we've uh, decreased our cost by 75% of how much uh, incentives we're providing projects. So you could see those declines coming down dramatically over time. And again, this chart shows total support for community solar projects, New York Sun megawatt block, MTC, community credit, community adder. And I think it tells um, a real big story. Now, when we deploy that much, um, there's a really great output uh, from that deployment. If you can go to the next slide, you can see uh, a fantastic story here. And that is New York State solar jobs as we deploy more solar and community solar is a huge portion of this and this includes residential solar and includes all most distributed solar in the state um, you could see the amount of jobs we have uh, as of 2009 the end of 2019 is 12,375 full and part-time jobs um, that that number is not only impressive um, but that number in my opinion is going to rise fairly dramatically because as we deploy more projects, that's where the jobs are. The jobs here are in New York State. Uh, there are labor jobs where people are building these projects and um, that's where the jobs come in. And when you see our deployment increase time over time, this, this number will continue to rise as I suspect it will over the next few years. Next slide, please. Okay, this is where I'm going to um, take a quick break. Right now it's uh, 142. I'd say at 147, we should all come back um, and um, reconvene. We'll restart this uh, presentation with Luke Forster, who many of you know. Uh, so we'll see you at 147. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us again. Um, we are back on now, and that concludes my portion of the presentation at the beginning. I hope everybody enjoyed the narrative and story. It's quite a story to tell, and I love telling it. I'm really proud of the work everyone's done here in New York State. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand this presentation off to Luke Forrester, our senior business analyst for the distributed energy resource team. 
I do know a lot of you, as I said earlier, have Luke on speed dial. He's every day talking to stakeholders and, and talking them through the value stack calculator. And he's just one of the most helpful people here on the NYSERDA New York Sun team for everybody. So uh, Luke's going to take us through uh, a brief section of the presentation about project economics and use cases. So Luke, take it away, please. David, thanks for the introduction. And John, could you flip the slide, please? I, I don't want to take too much time, and we certainly don't want to dive into too much detail. Um, so I'm just going to provide a brief set of numbers. Uh, first, I'd like to start off by giving a snapshot of, of what a quote unquote typical project looks like. Um, we see a lot of projects come through the megawatt block program. Um, and here, here are the traits that they've all had in common over the past few years. Most projects coming through are about four to five megawatts AC. Um, for those of you following at home in DC, that's about six to seven megawatts DC. Um, there are some smaller projects, you know, one megawatt, two megawatt, but we're really seeing developers are trying to come as close as they can to that five megawatt AC cap, really harness an economy of scale. Um, when possible, we're seeing developers are attempting to co-locate projects, you know, maybe getting a large parcel of land, subdividing it, and then do two or three projects on the same street or buying adjacent parcels. Um, you know, that's possible when the land and when the interconnect uh, characters allow that. We're seeing over the past few years, you know, almost everybody has switched from monofacial to bifacial modules. Fabulous. It only costs an extra few cents per watt. And that significantly significantly increases um, system output in terms of what hours per year. So that's a great shift in the industry. We're seeing that developers really like to use single axis trackers, you know, first of all, to maximize the output of the system on a year round basis, as well as increasing output in the shoulder hours, morning and afternoon, and squeezing a little bit more DRV value out. Um, realistically, trackers don't work on every parcel of land. Um, you really need a nice, large, relatively flat plot of land. So we're seeing maybe about 35 to 40 percent of project sites are able to use these trackers. The vast majority of projects coming through um, the megawatt block program are in national grids and NYSEG. Um, there is a healthy handful coming through in Rochester Gas and Electric as well. Um, we know National Grid and NYSEG are territories with relatively low value stacks. Uh, the revenue per kilowatt hour is certainly higher in Zone G with Central Hudson, Orange and Rockland, and even higher down in Con Ed and even, and even Long Island. But we're just seeing that there aren't that many parcels of land as well as viable interconnection locations in Zone G and down in Con Ed territory. Um, whereas in National Grid and NYSEG territory, you know, land and the interconnects are more bountiful. I realize there is certainly interconnection limits and costs, especially in grid. Um, but as a result, we're seeing most development is going to grid in NYSEG with a bit more going to grid. Um, as David's earlier slides on installations and completed projects pointed out, community solar has, has really been the, the primary game. Um, answering one question that came in through the chat earlier, out of our current pipeline of, of about 2.4 gigawatts of commercial industrial scale PV, about 94, 95% of that is currently community solar. Um, however, we're seeing now that the community credit and community adder are fully allocated in most utility territories. Many developers are trying to pivot um, away from community solar towards remote crediting, where they would have um, a small number of commercial off takers and no residential off takers. Revenue is going to be the exact same per kilowatt hour, um, but it's a way to reduce customer acquisition and customer management costs, having one, two, maybe three businesses rather than several hundred residential off takers. So we're seeing the industry pivot in that direction. Uh, we had a recent order from um, PSC and DPS, which allowed for more flexibility in remote crediting. So I, I think we're gonna see more of that trend moving forward. Next slide, please. And I'm, I'm just gonna give sort of a snapshot of project economics. This isn't 
deep dive. Um, but based on the projects we talked about in the earlier slide, four to five megawatts AC upstate, I wanted to give you kind of a kind of a pulse of where we see project costs versus project um, revenue. So you'll see the gray bars here are the estimated project costs. We know we know projects have initial costs, the EPC, as well as ongoing costs. But what I did for these gray bars is I said, okay, we know the upfront cost, um, and we have a very good sense of what a typical project's ongoing costs are between um, insurance, pilot, land lease, decommissioning funds, uh, customer management, all, and all of those items. So I took a net present value. 25 years of those ongoing costs and added that on to the initial cost of building a project. And you'll see that I have community distributed generation, community solar, as well as remote crediting. And the difference between those two set projects is just customer management type. You know, I, I assumed a much lower uh, customer acquisition and customer management cost, remote crediting versus community solar. Um, for each of those categories, you'll also see that there is a low end estimate and a high end estimate. Um, we know everyone's build costs are a little bit different. Interconnection is different um, depending on which utility you're in and what your exact Caesar results come back as. Um, so I wanted to put a range in here. I think it's dangerous to say, you know, these are the exact project costs without recognizing that there's a bell curve on that. You'll see some darker blue bars showing estimated revenue for projects. Um, that revenue is just the ITC at 26%. We're assuming no New York Sun incentive because we're talking about a post six gigawatt world today. Um, and then it's the net present value of the value stack for 25 years. Um, I'm assuming the E value of 2.7 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and for LBMP energy forecasts, I know everyone uses a different forecast. On the low end, I took a three year historic average, a 2% escalator on it. And for the high end, I took numbers from um, the NISOS Keras report, their 2020 report. I averaged together zones A through F. So, again, you know, just kind of a snapshot, a rough pulse of where we are. Generally speaking, you know, the, the revenue is a little bit lower. Than the costs here. That implies that there is, you know, some small to moderate amount of missing money in these projects. You know, I'm not presenting exactly what I think that value is today. Um, you know, I think that's something we could discuss further in the technical conference, but I just wanted to highlight where we seem to be regarding project costs and project revenues. Um, I expect to get a number of questions on this slide. And we'll try to answer those at the end of the conference. Um, so I'll pass the microphone now to my colleague, Carl Moss. Excellent. Next slide, please. Um, so everyone's great to see you all virtually. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Carl Moss. I direct energy and environmental analysis here at NYSERDA. Um, and we support our New York Sun colleagues as they look at new opportunities for the program going forward, as well as our overall policy support um, for the energy plan and, and for the Climate Action Council process. Um, so thanks to Luke and David for a great summary, really demonstrating incredible progress that the state has made in advancing our distributed solar markets. Um, as David mentioned, and I'll be building from some of his slides, um, I'll be presenting just a few slides today that aim to level set on, on the key concepts that are gonna guide our thinking as we look to the future of distributed solar in New York and lay out some of the key questions um, that we collectively need to consider. Um, this is really the beginning of the conversation um, and we do look forward uh, to uh, speaking and hearing from all of you in the coming weeks and, and the coming months. Next slide, please. Um, so before I get into some of the concepts, just wanted to speak briefly about our distributed solar benefits and why we care about this market, uh, why it's important for us to, to continue working um, in, in this space. Um, and really it's about the individual benefits they provide and, and the contributions that they can make to our 70 by 30 goal as we look to displace fossil fuels and reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve local air quality. Um, it 
Our distributed solar programs and markets allow us to, um, to create greater access to clean energy for all New Yorkers. Community solar in, in, in particular has the potential to serve thousands of, of, of low income households. Um, as has been mentioned before um, in the slides, uh, the uh, uh, New York Sun solar jobs are the major contributor to our clean energy economy with over 12,000 jobs today and, and the largest percent of our, renew our renewable energy jobs in the state. Um, the other aspect of, of, of distributed energy in general and uh, clean solar in, in, in specific is it allows us to add resources um, in, a, in a geographically diverse way to our, our energy portfolio. It puts clean energy generation in the ground now, um, where nearly all solar built in the state has thus far been distributed solar, and uh, sm smaller projects are easier to site and offer uh, many community benefits. Um, it also locates our zero emission electric generation closer to load where the projects that are much larger would be challenged to, to find those locations. And it provides local capacity value as, as demonstrated through the, uh, the VEDER process and the value stack, which specifically shows both bulk and local capacity values. And then finally, um, just building off of those incredible slides that we saw earlier, um, which demonstrated the cost decline over time. What we see is that continuation of our, of our successful cost re reductions will expand our overall market adoption and lead us towards a place of lower and eventually zero uh, uh, needed incentives. Next slide, please. So how does community solar and in general distributed solar fit into the 70 by 30 vision? Um, start off on this side just by looking at the column on the left, and that shows you progress towards our goal. So the, the, the orange portion of the column at 27% shows you what the operating re renewables are right now. Um, what you can see in the block above that, in the dark blue at 22%, those are all the uh, uh, contracted re renewables that we have in our pipeline. So if we combine those, we see that we are making great progress towards our 70%, where the addition of the existing operating renewables and, and the contracted pipeline equal 50%. Um, and we look at where those resources come from on the right, you can see that in terms of our operating renewables, a vast majority are still uh, our legacy large hydro, but distributed solar provides meaningful contributions to the operating renewables even right now. And when we look at the pipeline of what we expect, uh, David showed some of that uh, specific to New York Sun, but we see there's a, a, a diverse mix in the pipeline, including offshore wind, large-scale large solar, large-scale uh, onshore wind, um, and that the future deployment of distributed solar resources will continue to make significant contributions towards 70 by 30. Um, so those are the components that contribute to the 50% um, uh, of, of the way towards our goal. Um, but to get to our full 70%, we're going to need to procure more resources to get that remaining 20% in the light blue. And so the open question for all of us to discuss in the coming weeks is what role should our distributed solar resources play? As we balance out the, the, the many benefits of the different resources, and as I mentioned previously, there are some unique benefits and attributes to our distributed solar resources that we need to take into account. Next slide, please. So one critical aspect of our, our, uh, our existing VEDER programs is a value of carbon. Um, and you know, as this audience knows well, the conceptual framework for compensating uh, large uh, VEDER type solar projects is through our value stack um, and the value of distributed energy resources program. And so this value stack includes energy, bulk capacity, local capacity, and an externality value. Um, where this externality value was the primary uh, way to be able to incorporate a, a, a whole litany of, of uh, benefits that aren't in the market currently, but was primarily focused in its valuation on the avoided greenhouse gas emissions, um, the so-called value of carbon. Um, given that the, the Department of Environmental Conservation was tasked to take a fresh look at how we value carbon, we thought it was important to actually start here before getting into the options going forward. So next slide, please. So um, our DEC um, colleagues have recently put out a set of guidelines for the use by, by state agencies. And the Climate Act directed DEC to consider two approaches to the value of carbon, the uh, 
first approach was looking at a monetary cost of, of uh, damages. And that would result from an incremental increase in emissions as a result of climate change. This is commonly referred to as a social cost of carbon. Um, and that's a process that's been going on at the federal level for many years in which New York State uh, um, first adopted in 2016, actually, as part of a public service commission benefit cost analysis order. There was a second approach that our statute called for, and that's called a marginal abatement cost or MAC approach. And that establishes a value of carbon with reference to a specific emission re reduction goal. Um, in other words, what would be what would be the cost to reduce the last ton of emissions by the amount needed to meet a particular emissions target? Um, next slide, please. So that was the framework with which was laid out in the Climate Act. So when we look at the actual language in the DEC guidance, um, what, what they put forward was that whereas a, a damages approach is intended to establish a value of carbon for all sectors, a marginal abatement costs are typically estimated with regard to sector specific markets and technologies. Um, so the, the marginal abatement approach requires an analysis of the relevant economic sector of interest, and it would result or could result in multiple values of carbon across different sectors. Um, and what's really important in the DEC guidelines is that what they came forward with is that New York State today, um, the electric power sector is best positioned to apply marginal abatement approaches due to the available cost information and its history of effective emissions uh, re reduction policies. Um, so there's, you know, there's some complexity in the guidelines. They're there for each agency to take a look at and determine how to best apply to their stakeholders and their markets that they're regulating. Next slide, please. So what does that mean for the options post six gigawatts for ongoing solar su support? Next slide, please. As we look at a post six gigawatt world, we have to consider how we would price externalities going forward. Um, and as the law laid out, there's a monetary cost of damages approach versus this marginal abatement cost. So what would a monetary cost of damages look like um, in this context of solar policy? It, it would be a damage based approach where an administratively set externality value would be equal to the social cost of carbon. Um, for a marginal abatement cost, what we would look at is a, it would be a price that society would need to pay to achieve a, a, a specific solar goal. Um, and as David articulated early on, um, what we need to begin to think about is what is that next goal for our distributed solar resources? Once we have the goal, how do we set the price? Well, there actually would be options under a, a marginal abatement cost approach. And the price could be discovered through either competitive market approach or through an, an, an administrative process. So a, a market approach would have regular competitive solicitations that would look very much like our existing CES program, but would be specific to the solar markets that we're trying to address. Um, and, and, and an administrative approach would be based on the modeling of supply curves. So looking at what we would forecast as various prices at various quantities, and then it would be set based on those project economics. And when we look at our GEC guidelines, we, we find that what we need to do is dig into this marginal abatement cost approach in more detail, because it really appears to us based on those guidelines that that's gonna be our, our recommended path forward. And we wanna dig into those details with you in those coming weeks. Um, but next slide, please. Um, we'll be teeing up some of the concepts here, um, which we hope we can address through the second part of our tech conference and our eventual white paper. So when we look at what I've called option A, which is our market approach, what are some of the design considerations that we look to try to engage with with you in the coming weeks? One key question is who would administer such a program? Would it be an in, in, in a run program like our clean energy standard? Would we shift and have it be more of a, a utility-based program? You know, another key question for us that's unique to solar is how do we maintain our, our value stack signals? As I mentioned, our current value stack gives both energy and capacity specific revenues, and they are time and location specific. We don't wanna lose some of those values and some of those signals in our marketplace. Um, a critical question would be, what are, are the different contract types? Would they be fixed or indexed RECs? Um, we've recently changed to an index REC approach within our large scale programs. And it's a fair question to say, should we continue with that um, if we move forward with this market-based approach? Uh, what would be the uh, regularity or the cadence of our solicitations? 
would we sub-segment our technologies in our regions or would it be statewide DG solar? And then what would be the shape and tenor of the contracts? Some of the clear advantages of going with market-based approach are it keeps costs down through, through competitive pressures as we've seen over time in our large-scale re renewable energy programs. We've been seeing costs come down. In fact, for our 2020 solicitation had some of the lowest costs we've ever seen partly because of the scale that we've been going after and, and building up that competitive pressure, as well as switching to the index rack market. Um, another clear advantage is it's an adaptive framework. Um, and so each time we come out with a new solicitation, it gives us an opportunity to take the pulse of what is happening in our marketplace. Um, some of the challenges are clearly there's greater uncertainty for developers. Um, you know, if we have a fixed known incentive um, it's clearly more straightforward to do project development. There's also higher complexity for our developers. You know, as you begin to think about how would you respond to a open solicitation as compared to something that would just be a known quantity that, that's out on the street. Next slide, please. So our second approach that we'd love to hear some of your, your thoughts on is more of an, an administrative approach. And so this is really a continuation or building from our existing approach, but in this case, pivoting to a, a marginal um, abatement cost approach. Um, and so we need to arrive at a new deployment goal, and then we'd have to analyze what are the corresponding project economics. Um, in addition, we need to determine, as in all program areas, um, should we vary this value by, by, uh, by location? Some of the clear advantages are it's less complex um, and more certainty for our, our developer community. Um, a, a rolling program would allow for projects to advance without timelines that are having to pivot and be specific to a, a solicitation schedule that Maserta or the utilities would publish. Um, clearly, in terms of challenges, it, there's considerable uncertainty in how we estimate project economics, um, and they will vary over time. So setting a value um, can be challenging if it doesn't, if it's not able to adapt and change to an, an exogenous change. You know, a prime example would be if we have a shift in federal incentives, we'd want to be able to have a, an adaptive capability so we can adjust what our project economics in, in, in New York State would be. So that was a very quick rundown of some of what we feel are some of the key open questions that are related to the key concepts. Building from our Climate Act, building from the recent DEC guidelines, we want to be able to now pivot as we think about what happens beyond six gigawatts and how are we going to incentivize, if we deem it necessary, um, future solicitations or future offerings into the marketplace? Um, so with that, I think we can go to the next slide and I can turn it back over to David to highlight some of our next steps. Thanks so much, Carl. And, and thanks a lot, Luke. Uh, a lot to talk about, a lot to consider, a lot to think about. Um, and uh, appreciate, appreciate what you had to say, Carl and Luke. Um, so let's go to the next steps now. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So we want to make sure everyone understands this presentation will be posted uh, at the DPS case 15 E0751. So uh, I'll hold this slide up for a little while so you can write that down. Um, and uh, the comments on today's presentation, as I said from the from the beginning, can be informally filed to the case up until May 7th, which is the date of our next um, technical conference, so technical conference day two. Um, the technical conference uh, number two will be virtually held, just like this one was, uh, similar format on May 7th. And uh, we are going to concentrate solely or mostly on May 7th of hearing reactionary presentations from, from uh, all different people with different perspectives. And if you're not able to present on May 7th, of course, you uh, do have the ability to comment, uh, as I said, after uh, today's technical conference in the case 15E0751. Um, following the May 7th technical conference on day two, staff will release a technical conference's proceedings document, which will summarize what we've talked about here, uh, which is sort of a prelude to get us to um, you know, a formal white paper. So once we, um, once staff releases the technical conference proceedings document, we're going to target that uh, about the end of May, and we're going to target a formal white paper within this summer. Um, that formal white paper would be uh, much more um, 
<clears throat> much more built out, uh, have a lot more details in it um, as we sort of explore this together moving forwards. And of course, we'll be followed by a 60 day SAPA period. So uh, those are the next steps for us uh, at this point, which brings us to sort of phase three of, of our uh, WebEx presentation, which is the Q&A portion. If we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so again, if you have a question, please use the Q&A function in the WebEx to ask questions. Uh, we have uh, a bunch of questions to, to answer now. I think what I'd like to do is, Luke, if it's okay with you, um, st there's a lot of questions for you. Um, I'm sure a lot of questions are going to come in for Carl too, based on uh, he just finished his presentation. But Luke, maybe you can just start knocking off some of the questions that we got and, and give the answers um, that are appropriate, if you don't mind. Yeah, sounds good. Um, there may be some awkward pauses as, uh, as I bounce between questions, but I'll, I'll hit what I can. Um, question from James Feinstein. Feinstein. Uh, so we've got a pipeline of about 2.4, 2.5 gigawatts in New York Sun. These are projects that have already locked in their New York Sun incentive. They've also paid their 25% utility upgrade payment. They have their zoning, they have their planning board approval, so they're pretty mature. Um, these projects have also locked in community credit, community adder, MTC, you know, as applicable. And uh, James's question is, it's how much of that 2.5 gigawatts is community solar? And the answer is about 94%. With the remaining 6% being either residential, small commercial, um, on-site, or remote net metered. Um, and I think that answers Joshua Gillibard's question as well. Um, that pipeline does refer to projects that have locked in their nice sort of incentive. There, there are a large number of questions that basically say, hey, where can I find this particular statistic? Most of our program data is available on the open New York data set. You can access that through the New York Sun webpage. You can also do a Google search for NYSERDA Open NY data. Um, it's essentially a downloadable data set. There's a line item for every project that's received NYSERDA support. Um, and you can filter that data, you can organize it, you can make a pivot table. And it's a great way to back into stats like um, average cost per year, you know, average project size, you can filter by county. Um, we do track community solar versus non-community solar. So that's a great resource for, for looking up specific data. Uh, there's a question, how many gigawatts are roof mount versus ground mount? Question came from, comes from James. Uh, we don't explicitly track roof mount versus ground mount. Uh, that being said, the, the vast majority of projects over one megawatt are ground mounted. So most of New York State's community solar and remote metered projects will be ground mounted. Um, when we're looking at smaller projects, be they residential or small commercial, um, as well as projects in New York City, those are much more likely to be roof mounted. Um, question from Shiam. He's asked, okay, so, so the question is essentially, we need to get another 600 to 700 megawatts DC of projects in order to achieve that six gigawatt mandate, six gigawatts by 2025. Um, the plan for getting that extra 600 megawatts is we do have incentive funding left in the megawatt block program. We have a bit left in the commercial industrial, which will fund projects um, similar to the ones we talked about today, community solar upstate. Um, I expect we'll see some community solar, some remote metered. We also have block capacity for residential projects, both upstate and downstate. And we also have block capacity remaining for what we call non-residential, which will also be called small commercial. We have that available for upstate and downstate as well. So when you add together, you know, those, those various um, regions, that gives us the remaining six, 700 megawatts that we need to achieve that six gigawatt goal. I'm gonna tackle a few more questions. I'm just for the document here.
there was a question regarding expected attrition from that 2.5 gigawatt pipeline. Um, traditionally, we've seen very, very low attrition from these me megawatt scale commercial industrial projects. The reason being that these projects have already um, secured the site. They've already gone through the Caesar study. They pay their 25% upgrade cost. They've also gone through municipal permitting. Um, so we've historically seen a very low attrition or fallout rate on those. We may see slightly higher attrition because some projects were submitted expecting the community adder or community credit. Um, and Luke, if I could just add a slight detail there, totally agree. I would say also that uh, when we redesigned the New York Sun megawatt block, as you saw in the prior slides that I went through, we increased the project maturity for projects coming into the New York Sun program on the commercial industrial side. So uh, most of those projects, all of the projects really uh, had to secure the 25% interconnection fee and get zoning board approval. Um, so we went from a 20% attrition rate to single digit uh, attrition rate. Um, and I agree with Luke, it might tick up a little bit more because of the lack of community adder, but um, it, it's not like, it's not something we could bank on. David, thank you. And, and I'll add one more point too. If a project that prints out or, or, or falls out of the queue, that's also not the end of the world because we take those dollars that were awarded to that project. We put it back in the megawatt block where those dollars could be allocated to another project. That, that incentive money is not taken off the table. Um, I think I've answered everything I can with a, with a cursory look through the document. I'll pause here and David or Carl, if you'd like to take a few. Yeah, questions. thanks Luke. Go ahead. Yeah, maybe um, while you take a look at some of the questions that have just come in, I'll try to address a couple of them that I've seen a little bit earlier. Um, so the first question I've seen, um, I'll just read it out. It sounds like you are thinking of an environmental value specific to solar. Why would it differ by renewable technology instead of being consistent for all clean renewable technology? Um, and I guess just to address that question, as discussed in the DEC guidelines, the, the uh, value of carbon can be connected with specific policy goals. Um, and so as we look at the complexity of, the, of our decarbonization needs um, as, as being articulated before our climate action council we see that different sectors will need to likely go at, at different rates and will have their own sub targets um, and so as those targets are, are spelled out we will more likely than not have different um, marginal abatement costs that are going to be associated with some of those sub targets and so therefore we anticipate there will be different MAC values for, for, for different sectors and for different technologies within sectors. So it's ultimately about if there's a policy goal that's set, then we can pivot and focus on a, a marginal abatement cost approach that will get us to that target. Um, next one that I see that I think I can address, uh, I'll read it again. Although the CLCPA is silent on the portion of distributed energy, including community solar, that will be needed to reach the 70% renewable energy standard or the 2040 emissions reduction goal beyond the explicit six gigawatt target, how many additional gigawatts of DG will be required to support these long-term goals? Um, and so while there's no specific requirement for DG resources, um, and one place you can look to is the recent power grid study that DPS and I sort of recently published, which laid out a technology pathway to our 2040 goals. Um, you know, there, there's no specific requirement for DG resources that we've found. The key question is, how should the state continue to realize those benefits that I highlighted and that are associated with our, our DG resources? So there are unique attributes and benefits to our distributed energy resources. Um, and what we need to do is take a look at those benefits um, and then make an assessment of the costs and, and do we believe that those benefits will exceed costs. All right, um, next question I can see here um, again regarding marginal abatement costs. So regarding the marginal abatement costs, does NYSERDA have any preliminary estimates on what the distributed solar goal will be or thoughts on how it will be set? Um, so it's a great question um, and it's one that we want to explore through what we've initiated today. So this process that we're, we're embarking upon with you all um, will be the process in which we explore possible goals and what level should those goals be. Um, and so 
will be certainly seeking input. Um, and there are a number of uh, variables that uh, uh, David put forward in terms of hosting capacity limits um, from, you know, you know, what do we think are is actual technical potential to realize our community solar growth over time? Um, and when we can gather all of that input, you know, we'll distill that with some of our thinking into an actual formal white paper, which will come out later in the summer. Um, and that will initiate a formal comment process. Um, so we do anticipate that the white paper, as David said, will have more specifics, both around policy mechanisms, but also around goal setting. Um, so those are some of the questions. Maybe Luke, if you've dug up any others, if you wanna, or, or um, uh, 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 David, if you wanna address any others, we, yeah, I'll take a look we, at the list. Yeah, thank, thanks, Carl. Um, I want Max to answer a, a question that came in, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Good, good afternoon, everyone. This is Max Joel. I'm the program manager for the New York Sun Initiative. I uh, wanted to address a question that came in about benefits for disadvantaged uh, communities. Uh, we got a, a couple different questions along those lines. Um, so, uh, one to reference back to the presentation. Uh, of course, any structure ultimately per pursued would meet the requirements of the CLC PA um, in general, of course, and specific to disadvantaged communities. Um, and to start the thinking on the exact mechanisms for doing that, I'd really refer back to uh, Carl's slides about the marginal abatement cost approaches and the response he just gave. Uh, so Carl spoke generally to how uh, different policy uh, goals could be incorporated into that marginal abatement cost approach, uh, and that certainly applies to targeting benefits to disadvantaged communities as well. Thanks a lot, Max. Appreciate it. Um, uh, Luke, did you want to jump back in? Do you have enough questions to answer? Uh, I'm, I'm going to pass for now. There, there's a okay. lot. There's a lot here. Okay, yeah, uh, so for everyone on the phone or on the WebEx, please give us a moment to uh, collect our thoughts and look through a, a dozens and dozens of questions and figure out uh, the proper way to answer them. So if you could, if Carl wants to jump in, if he's got some, uh, some answers ready to go, uh, go ahead, Carl, but if not, we'll wait a minute. Yeah, I've got one here that um, I'm seeing that I can quickly address. So the uh, next question that was up is, will new CDG options replace meter value stack? Um, and as, as I mentioned during the presentation, what we're really looking to do is how do we best complement our existing VDR value stack um, with an eye on trying to retain those locational signals um, that come with the, with the value stack. So the exact nature and shape of the new compensation mechanism is something we wanna work on with you all. Um, but I think a key principle we have is, is to retain what we see as, as a strong benefit of the value stack signal. Um, which again allows our markets to adapt to the needs, whether it be the capacity needs, um, you know, whether it be the kind of local bulk needs or the or or the local capacity needs. You know, it's one of the key benefits of our distributed energy resources. And we want to make sure that local capacity is located where we need it most. Question. Um, answer from me, will I sort of send out an email announcement about the May 7th technical conference? Uh, yes, we will. Um, you can also get the, the registration information off of the DPS website um, on the VDR DMM. Hey, David, there's a question about the Con Ed community credit petition. Would you like me to answer that? Sure, Warren, thank you. Um, so that has been separately sapped from from this. We understand um, parties would like to see uh, response as quickly as possible. So you can submit comments to the, I believe it was a New York City petition, but submit comments under uh, this case number 15E0751. And if you've not done it before, there are instructions on the PSC website on how to submit comments in a proceeding. Um, you'll have, you know, a 60 day period under SAPA to make those comments. Whatever we do has to go to the commission. So it can't be any quicker than that. Warren, can I trouble you with another couple questions while you're on? Sure, David, the lightning round. 
lightning round. Here we go. With the e, new E value release today, is there any opportunity for the value to be applied retroactively to projects which paid 25% after end to last after the end of the last community adder block? Letter released today okay. appears to imply that it is applied starting today. Yeah, the, uh, unfortunately not. We, we do not have the authority to go backwards. Um, retroactively, the commission orders are clear um, of what the procedure here is. So it's, it's just going forward. And Warren, while you're on, would you mind telling the group um, a little bit about um, the E-value change today? Uh, might be helpful for those that are not uh, hitting refresh on the DMM uh, server all the time. Uh, just what it is, you don't want me to go into the weeds of how it was calculated, right? No, yeah, just um, the E value itself, what it went from and what it and what it is. Now. Right, it went from, so for it's been at 2.741 cents per kilowatt hour for a while now. And we went uh, since uh, NYSERDA uh, recently switched to a an index rec approach, which really uh, it seems to be driving costs for large scale renewables down. We were clear that it was going to be set based on uh, the social cost of carbon that Carl referenced, which uh, back in 2016 um, we cited uh, in the DCA framework order. So we just were uh, followed the commission order and recalculated based on our uh, existing process and the existing uh, federal social cost of carbon, um, but it applied to a slightly future 20 year period and it came out to 3.1 cents approximately per kilowatt hour rather than 2.74 cents per kilowatt hour. So I know that's not an increase that uh, uh, totally absorbs uh, the loss of a community credit. We're not saying that, oh, here's our answer, we're done. It was just an update that uh, we could do at this time without having to go back to the commission. All right, thank you very much, Warren. There are a lot of questions asking about- David, uh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, David, I was gonna jump in, but maybe you're also reading my mind. Why don't you go ahead? Uh, no, you go ahead, Carl. Let's let's hear what? your uh, ESP at work here. Yeah. So there was a question that said, "What is the timeline to develop the uh, MAC approach and implement it?" Um, and I guess my short answer is that we do expect this formal white paper to put forward what the what the overall MAC approach would be for DG Solar. And maybe it's worth David just going back to that uh, next step slide. Maybe just because I think there are a number of timeline questions. If you want to re reiterate what the timeline is. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so obviously when we're talking about the second technical conference ending on May 7th, um, and then uh, at the end of May, DPS staff releasing the technical conference proceeding document, and then that leads to a formal white paper this summer. I believe, Warren, it's probably about a 60-day SAPA period after that and then uh, in order to follow. So when you're looking at this whole proceeding, you're really looking at a year end, um, I think conclusion that the commission would rule on. Is that correct, Warren? Is that about right? That, that is about right. And what we're trying to do here is, you know, we have uh, past success in DDER in, in getting significant stakeholder input before we put out a, a formal white paper. At the same time, we realize that time is of the essence. So we think we struck balance with the proceeding, the, the informal proceedings and comments people can provide, um, as you mentioned in your slides, but getting us to a white paper that is that has the time to take into account those comments and hopefully put out a better white paper than we would just do working uh, isolated on our own but then have people then be able to make their formal comments. And of course, by law, um, there's just a required SAPA period before the commission can act to allow you to, to provide those comments. Yeah, and maybe just building on that, David. Um, 
So another question I think relates is why are you ruling out the monetary cost of damages approach? And, and as David and Warren just said, you know, this is an open process. Um, so we're not ruling out any options. Um, what I wanted to lean into with the slides is to reflect back what the DEC guidelines are around valuing carbon um, and the specific recommendations that came forward through that process around electricity system valuation. But there are no options that are currently ruled out. And so we definitely want to hear from folks on May 7th on pros and cons around different options um, and, and where you think the uh, state should, should try to lean in um, as we develop our, our formal white paper proposal. Yeah, and just for, for, for utmost clarity, even if uh, someone thinks uh, it would be very easy to just adopt the DEC, social cost of carbon, that would still be a material change in compensation such that we would really have to go back to the, we couldn't do that without going back to the commission. So regardless, we have to go back to the commission and, and keep in mind, we are always balancing um, appropriate compensation for the, the benefits being provided as well as the costs of providing those um, that are being, you know, paid for by uh, rate pairs and trying to get as much carbon reduction as we can for the buck uh, subject to other state goals, such as, you know, disadvantaged communities and all those other important social things, benefits we need to, to balance. So that's why we have to go through this process of providing uh, well thought out options to the commission. Um, rather than just rush to one particular option. Thanks, Warren. Uh, Luke, did you have any more that you saw that uh, that are in your department? Yeah, I'll, I'll take one. There was a question on the slide that I presented where I showed the project cost. Um, what I was trying to get at on that slide is a new project that's just being developed now with New York's with an, I'm sorry, with no New York sun money and no community adder would have a tough time penciling out existing projects that are already operational and got their incentive money you know, are, are operating and being installed that we assume are, are not operating at a loss. So that slide was for new projects with no additional. Thanks, Luke. Um, there's a question, is the new E-value effective immediately or will there be a delay? Uh, Warren, is, is that effective if someone were to pay their 25% today? Um, are they getting yes. the 3.1? Okay, so yes, the answer I is it's effective. In, yeah, I believe that's right in the letter. So okay. whatever our lawyers put in the letter is what's true. <laughs> but I believe that is as of today. Okay, thank you. Uh, David, hey, David, question. and maybe Max, I, I think there was just a request um, if Max could say his answer again. I think some folks maybe couldn't hear it. Yeah, absolutely. And apologies, I'll, I'll speak a little louder. So the uh, question I answered uh, was um, about benefits to disadvantaged communities under a new structure. So the response I gave was that uh, any structure, you know, would of course be following the requirements of the CLCPA. Uh, more specifically, uh, both of the marginal abatement cost scenarios that uh, Carl discussed, um, as Carl referenced in one of his uh, answers to a previous question, uh, would allow for uh, specific segments or project types to be targeted in accordance with state policy goals. Uh, and that uh, would potentially be the mechanism by which benefits uh, to are delivered to disadvantaged communities uh, under a, a new um, distributed solar structure. Thanks, Max. Um, I will, someone asked the question, row 59 for uh, those on our team. Can you please repeat his updated rec value now? 3.1 cents a kilowatt hour, the answer is yes. Uh, 
Uh, David, there's a question either you or I could answer about, uh, can we please keep feeder stable, uh, some stability for investors that are planning months ahead? I can try take a shot at that and you can supplement. Sure. That's fair. So I, we hear you, we discuss this all the time internally about when, you know, we take very seriously when we change Veter. Um, but it was a brand new program um, and we did learn as we went along. So the April 2019 uh, improvements, and they really were improvements, while they may have been unstable with respect to what the rules in the tariffs say, they actually produce um, more stable um, revenues in some instances. We, uh, one of the things we did is we tried to make the DRV element um, more uh, bankable, if you will, um, by making it uh, more reliable. Now that had a downside in making it, um, you know, less dynamic and reflecting changing system conditions. So we're always trying to strike a balance between, you know, what economists might think is the best possible price signal and what practical markets need to be able to invest. And so we, we realized that when we change the tariff, we are making it um, a situation where people have to now reevaluate and see what it is, but we always try to make those changes um, something that really improves the development of projects going forward and, and reflecting the market itself, as David's slide showed, is changing all the time. And, you know, we are constantly trying to keep up with that. So we hear you, we understand, um, we, we do consider it a lot, but we also can't uh, not change meter when we know we can make an improvement. And sometimes those improvements are suggested by the development community. Thanks, Juan. Um, bouncing back to Carl. Carl, do you have anything answerable on yours? I know it takes yeah, a while to, looking, to look through these I, questions. Yeah, yeah I, I do see a number of process questions. I think folks are just wondering where can they learn about when the E value gets changed? So maybe someone can just re reiterate what the matter number is because I assume everything gets posted yeah, so on DMM. I'll do that. And and for some of these questions, there is a spreadsheet that shows you if you're comfortable with working through spreadsheets, what numbers were used and how I got to those numbers. It, it, um, it the case number is 15 dash E dash 0751. So if you go into it, you'll see today was posted a letter that describes what was being done to change it to the three point, approximate 3.1 cents and also a spreadsheet that shows the calculation that gets you there, which is using the same methodology the last time it was done, but with updated numbers. And I will say it's a fast moving industry, a fast moving market, a lot of regulatory changes. I do wanna highlight that um, the importance of, of going through trade groups, the CIAs, NICEAs, CCSAs, ACEs, New York Best of the world, um, it's really beneficial to join those trade groups because they're the ones who stay on top of this and obviously uh, reiterate what their findings are to their membership. So it is very helpful to join those groups. Uh, so uh, David's suggestion of the day. Question from Gillian Black. Does the, is the Veter calculator updated with a new um, E-value? Not yet. It's, it's only been out for about an hour. Um, we will publish updated value with an email. In the meantime, you can just manually type in the 3.1 cent per kilowatt hour value there. That field is editable. Uh, I'll tackle a tough question. Um, from Mr. Gall, given that nearly three months has passed since the community adder incentives have been nearly allocated, has NYSERDA or DPS considered making any new incentive or updated compensation available to projects in development after February 1st to ensure development continuity? Um, 
Not at the moment. We did just add max, I believe, about 200 megawatts to um, the latest block. Um, we saw one sector that was not moving very fast and would likely not get to the finish line by 2025, which is the non-residential rest of state last block. And we, we took that uh, dollars and increased the capacity of 200 megawatts into the last block and rest of state. Um, but there are no plans after that. And that was row 26 on our end. And we're looking through questions. Some of them are redundant, so we have to keep reading them. Warren, th this might be um, a question for you. Um, is DPS staff and I sort of considering other changes to the value stack core components, such as transmission reduction value or changes to the structure of any of the existing components? So I would say that, um, as many in the industry know, you should um, keep an eye on the marginal cost of service proceeding, which is where the uh, DRV and I believe also the LSRV values uh, can change um, based on uh, changing utility uh, avoidable distribution transmission costs. So that's the only area that I'm thinking of other than what we're talking about today. And of course the LVMP um, and, and you know, the commodity values are, are always changing. Thank you, Warren. There's another question. Is nice sort of thinking about reopening megawatt block incentive for rest of state. I'm not sure I understand that because it's open still. Yeah, David, I can also jump in on one. Um, okay, please. So, yeah, this one says given the E value is part of the value stack um, and that the DEC guidelines have a much higher value than the current, uh, do you expect the value stack will go up? Um, so this is with reference, and I think at least one other colleague made reference to the much higher social cost of carbon that's currently in the uh, DEC guidelines. And I guess so So my general answer is that it, it's the purpose of this process for us to explore what that externality value should be. Um, and certainly there's a, a much higher social cost of carbon that's embedded in the DEC guidelines, but they've also put forward for the electric sector that it may be more appropriate to have a, a marginal payment cost. So this is exactly the question that we're looking to address through this process. And we look for you all to, to weigh in. And we would expect that by the end of the process, we would have a different approach to the externality value than what we see today. Yeah, can we stay there for a sec, Carl? Because I think that's coming up quite a bit. And that's one of the reasons why we had Luke Forrester kind of go through the missing money slide in the project economics use case portion is um, that's with no New York Sun incentive. And you could see, um, although the projects are underwater, um, they're not that far off. And if we're looking at a social cost of carbon calculated at 2% rather than 3%, that's probably more than doubling the current E-value we have today, which would be greater than the missing money. So it's not really a, a, a sound way to go, just adopting that one number includes in, in adding the value stack on top of that. Um, so clearly that's why Carl's giving us the options and showing us that there's different methodologies that state can use where, um, it's not just that, that, that fixed cost, uh, damage cost that, that, that is an option, but also at a marginal abatement cost. That's an option. Right. And, you know, when we want to recognize that that, uh, damage cost framework is incredibly important and we're going to be using it throughout the course of time through our. Climate Action Council crisis and in many different venues. But what we're looking at is for the specific issue around what comes next for our, our distributed solar, we need to look at potentially shifting to this marginal abatement approach once we determine what a, a, a specific goal will be. Um, and again, as has been mentioned a few times, this is a balancing act. We wanna go after as many benefits as we can, but do it at the least cost to our rate payers as, as possible.
Hey, David, there's a couple questions I can clarify or asking for clarification. Okay, great. Thank um, you. One is a comment that the utility, sh that it's quoting today's letter about the change in the E-value where we say the utility should take any steps necessary to implement this change, including updating the value stack crediting paren caps VDER hyphen CRED statement beginning with the March 2021 20, filing. And uh, that's confusing some people, making it sounds like it's not effective. The 3.1 cents is not effective till May 1st. Um, but it, earlier in the letter, you'll see that our instructions are for projects locking in their quote unquote E value, that it takes effect as of the date of this correspondence, which is today's date of the letter, April 21st. This instruction at the bottom letter is to utilities about the monthly statements that they send to us and that get put on the tariff records or statement records, if you will, each month about what the current values are. And they only come in once a month. And so we're just making sure that utilities are reminded that in addition to, as of today's date, projects lock in the 3.1 cents in their monthly statements, they should reflect that change. Uh, that's clarification number one. Another clarification question is, is the value of carbon approach in addition to the E-value in the value stack, or is it intended to be only one? I can see why that's, that's confusing. confusing. So the E-value up until now has been our uh, value for carbon abatement. And we said it would be the higher of either at the time, back in 2017, the higher of the cost of tier one RECs, the large scale RECs, or at that time, what the commission determined to use for the social cost of carbon, um, whichever was higher. So it was just, that was the adder to the uh, in the, that was the element in the value stack. And in, in addition to that, there was a, at that time it was called an MTC adder for certain customers or participants, which we changed to the community credit in April. And that expanded its uh, availability to a broader class of customers. And then of course, when that, those funds get exhausted, we moved on to the community adder when we had those funds. Now going forward, and in Carl's discussion of the social cost of carbon, which is now much higher at the DEC, the um, what it takes for us to abate carbon, which has been lower than that, as was just recently discussed, and what the, the e-credit should be under either a damages cost approach or an abatement cost approach. And then the issue, the very highly related issue is, well, what does it take for these projects to pencil out so we don't kill the market as it was, as it were, are all related questions. So going forward, we're looking for, we're looking for you know, okay, what e-value should we use? separate question, is that enough or does it need more above the community adder? Or should we just cut to the chase and just say, what are the marginal abatement costs for this kind of uh, uh, portion of the CLCPA portfolio? <clears throat> and so I can see why people are confused, but going forward, we can discuss how to keep that from being confusing. But the bottom line really is, what do we want our forward, now that we think we're gonna achieve the six gigawatts, what should our goal be going forward? And what's it gonna to take to achieve that goal? All right, thanks Warren. I think I'm gonna jump in and answer a few questions here. Uh, one question is when you said the E-value update was not re retroactive, did you mean for project el el eligibility or for bill crediting? Um, and when an E-value is assigned to a project, it's assigned at the point and date at which you 
um, get your 25% interconnection fee paid. Once you pay that fee, that's when you lock in on the E value. And so if you pay that fee tomorrow, you're going to get the new E value. So it's project milestone is the answer. I was line 63. Uh, line 66. Uh, megawatt block 17 is likely to run out by the end of June. Will megawatt block 17 be extended beyond June or July? And is there sufficient available funding to do so? Uh, we do not intend to do that unless we see massive attrition so that we can. Um, but at this point in time, uh, the whole purpose of this, this gathering, conversation and talking is to figure out what's next after uh, that block expires. Um, so the answer was likely no. Um, scrolling down, now that you have clearly stated there are no plans to renew the community adder, are there any plans to reinstate a community credit? If not, then remote crediting will receive the same value of CDG. Um, so yeah, that, that's true. It, it would uh, have the same value. Um, this is not our plan to, um, you know, uh, reinstate a community credit. However, as Carl mentioned in, in his presentation, everything is on the table. So if that's something that you feel is the only way to get us there in a fiscally responsible manner, then I would put that in your comments, but that's not um, something that we're looking to promote right now. Um, currently the commercial uh, upstate megawatt block 17 is are, are almost filled. Are there any plans extending for open new blocks? So the answer is no, I think I answered that earlier. Um, unless, of course, we see some, some major attrition, uh, we don't have the funds or can't pull from other sectors to do so. And again, that's what this proceeding is about. Um, there's a lot of more questions coming in. So if, if someone has some answers to jump in, go ahead. If not, we'll take a moment to keep reading and answering. As a reminder, the E value is locked in when a project pays their 25% utility upgrade payment. There is no required utility upgrade payment, perhaps for a very small project, that E value is instead locked in. The interconnection agreement is executed by the utility. The slides will be published as discussed. I know we've answered this several times. Please uh, understand we will publish both this presentation and the recorded uh, WebEx. Uh, one here's one, Warren. Just one question is, what's the plan for CDG? Much of the discussion has been about Veter. Um, actually, much of our discussion really is about CDG. I'm, I'm sorry we haven't made that clear. Um, as I said uh, in the beginning, we had MTC and then with market transition credit, and then community credit, and then. Um, uh, community adder for community DG over and above the VEDER value stack, and those are running out. And so we're asking for uh, to you all to help us develop what should be our next um, 
next steps, next target, next goal, and means to achieve um, community solar going forward. A lot of questions on the E value um, and they're sort of repeating themselves and we're sort of saying the same thing over again. But one is regarding E value. What if you paid your 25% previously, but not yet registered the project with NYSERDA because we don't have a site plan yet? Do we get the old E value or the new E value? I'll be clear. You get the existing E value at the time you pay your 25% interconnection cost period. Uh, here's another one. Can you confirm that the E value? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> same answer. <laughs> Uh, what will happen to the CDG in Con Ed territory once the current credit available block is full? So I think you're referring to the um, community credit block is full. Um, obviously, there's a, a live petition in with the commission about uh, is, is there going to be added uh, capacity to the community credit? Uh, so aside from that subject matter, um, you can still move forwards with community solar, but you, there is not going to be a community credit available if it runs out. Max, there's a LMI question here. Maybe you could field if you don't mind. It's how will the NYSERDA LMI adder function if there's no megawatt block incentive available for projects? I believe the LMI adder is not a commercial industrial uh, adder, is it, Max? Isn't it just non-residential and uh, residential? Uh, yeah, I, that probably is in reference to the forthcoming inclusive community solar adder, uh, which would be for both non-residential and commercial uh, industrial. Um, so we, we have not published the final incentive levels, uh, but in the um, presentation uh, that uh, my colleagues and I gave uh, a couple of weeks ago, which is uh, posted on the New York Sun website, um, we provided a uh, incentive level of 20 cents a watt for projects that um, did not receive the um, community adder or community credit. Uh, you know, we, we haven't, um, I, I guess that presentation did not explicitly say whether or not a project could receive that adder um, if it came in after the exhaustion of the commercial industrial uh incentive block uh you know which currently is has a little more than 200 megawatts um and i don't have a direct answer now other than to say it, it's uh, you know i think it's unlikely that the community adder i'm sorry the inclusive community uh solar adder would still have remaining capacity after the uh you know 200 plus megawatts currently in the the cni block are exhausted but we will address that um you know, very clearly in the final program rules for the inclusive community solar adder. All right, thanks, Max. There's a further uh, clarification request on on uh, what I tried to clarify with respect to the E value, uh, the value stack, and um, anything above uh, the E value and the value stack. Will there still be a, a, a specific E value? And the answer to that question is, it depends on what we propose as a, a methodology for going forward. For example, if we were to um, pattern uh, this uh, approach after what we're currently doing in the tier one, which is to have a bidding approach where bidders just bid their strike price, that is, they're all in cost. Um, and then have it indexed to something like um, a market energy value or something that we all decide is a, is a better index. Well, then the, the net payment under that approach would be sort of an all-in payment that would include the E-value as the tier one uh, rec payments are. 
On the other hand, if we, uh, under an administrative approach, we could choose to continue with a separate e-value and then have some kind of program for tranching or just a, a fixed adder um, so that the, the possibilities right now, we're not trying to foreclose too quickly. So it could be either way is the answer, depending on what options we develop. All right, thanks, Warren. I've, I've got a few questions I think I can attempt to answer here. Uh, the community credit and community adder were developed to incentivize CDG specifically as nearly all remote net meter projects benefited CNI customers. New compensation being discussed here would apply to both CDG and CNI. What will cause developers to pursue CDG specifically under the framework given the higher costs? It's a good question, um, and that that needs to be discussed through this proceeding. I mean. Um, if there was some sort of competitive solicitation, that's a question we need to answer is, um, would we pay more for community solar than we would for uh, remote crediting? Um, would there be a low income uh, requirement or disadvantaged community requirement to that? Um, and also I would say that um, with um, net crediting and CCAs, um, and other, you know, programs that might come out that make customer acquisition very bankable and and very minimal in its cost. There might be um, a financing priority to community solar over remote crediting because it, you know, has a more distributed um, subscription base. So uh, what we're trying to do as a state is really lower the cost of community solar, essentially through CCA opt-outs and net crediting and, and the such to make it so that the two, the, the variance between the two is, is minimal. Uh, and we'll see if we get there, um, but, but that's one of the goal and, and a good question. Um, another question is, although there is no intention of expanding community adder, there is, potential that it can be reintroduced based on feedback from participants today and the comment period. Um, there is potential, you know, I, I think, as Carl said, you know, we want to hear what your thoughts are. Um, it's not something that we're thinking would be our first option. Um, we think that um, we can move on to a, a successive, you know, platform or a successive way to, 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 uh, take us beyond six gigawatts other than what we've already done. Uh, that's what we're looking to do and that's what we're hoping to achieve. But again, um, we're taking um, all, all feedback, you know. Um, so another question is, um, is there anything in particular you would prefer to see from the industry to aid you in the process of figuring out what's next? When we come back with comments on the 7th, Anna Diaz. Uh, thanks, Anna, really appreciate that question. Um, love it when people think of us. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. You, we, we don't pretend we know everything. Um, we try to know everything, but we don't pretend we know everything. And as we said from the, from the get-go, the way we got here was with participation from all across the board, all different stakeholders, and we want to continue to do so. So the more um, participation that we have from the community, the, the better off we are. If that participation is consolidated in, in single comments, it's really helpful. So I think my answer, Anna, is is mostly if you can try to go through trade groups and 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 sort of um, focus your your vantage points and and feedback. That that's really helpful to us. Um, otherwise, it just becomes a lot of different opinions. That's hard to aggregate and figure out where the masses are. I'll pause there and see if anyone else wants to jump in. Yeah, this is yeah, a question. Um, but line number 97. Um, I just want to clarify, is it 97? I believe so. Yes, the e-value calculations. I just want to clarify the difference between what we're talking about going forward, which has to go back to the commission. I have a question of what is the timeline for the e-value calculations and getting approval from the public commission? The e-value calculations that were submitted today do not require commission approval. They are live as of today because the commission back in um, the original theater order authorized us to make these updates as long as we stick to the specific formula and the specific decisions that have already been made. And it's just a matter of update as we roll forward in time. 
So there's there's no taking the the E value calculations that went into the DMM today. They they are live. Um, everything else we're talking about is of options for where we go from here in terms of exhausting our community adder funds. Um, what to do about new DEC E values versus marginal abatement costs versus marginal damage costs. You know, getting beyond the six gigawatts. That's what has to go to the commission. But what was filed today is now a fact. This is Luke. We had a question regarding community credit tranche two. Um, as you may remember, there's a wait list kept projects that pay their 25% but missed out on community credit. Um, there has been like a negligible amount of, of projects that had community credit tranche one that dropped out. Um, so as a result, there has been virtually no movement on that wait list. I was just informed by our events team that we have a record of 101 questions on WebExes. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, um, <laughs> but uh, obviously this is a, a major sign of, of um, the amount of people that want to be involved and will be involved in this total process. So thanks everybody for your participation. And uh, I think we're going to pause for a second and see if there's any more questions we could answer. A lot of the questions are repeats um, or just comments, which is fine. Uh, I think that what I'd like to do is wrap this up. Um, I don't see any questions that are sort of uh, answerable at this time, but it looks like um, like we have answered a lot of questions and we've got a lot accomplished. I will pause first before we end this technical conference. And if there's anybody on the DPS or NYSERDA side that sees a question that we can answer, please jump in. Hey, Dave, I think there was a question on process, which is, you know, when would any change become effective? It would become effective when there was an order. Um, so anytime there's a proposal from staff in the form of a white paper that goes through a public comment process, it's upon the commission to then decide what they do with it. Um, so we all would need to wait and anticipate whatever the commission decides to do with an order. Um, and maybe David, I'll just also reinforce, you know, thanks to everyone who's taking part. We've got a great showing today. Um, this has been a decade in the making. Um, obviously, it's it's both hopefully strong policy thinking, but also incredible market activity that's made this happen, right? We hope to enable and catalyze you all, and you all have really stepped forward to, to grow this incredible market. So thank you all. One last uh, one question. Um, are there plans to change the 25 kilowatt size limitations in place for mass market? Uh, Adam, what I think, Adam, that, that question is uh, referring to subscribership size. I uh, know the answer is there's no plan right now to change that. Question 104, um, can the utility due dates on 25% interconnection payments made until we have more guidance on which direction the industry is going? I don't have an answer for that. DPS, if you'd like to provide some color on that, or maybe that's just something. Before we do, I, it's a tricky one. Um, I have half the industry telling us they want that, half they don't, because it just gets us right back to interconnection queue clogs. So it's a very difficult 
question. I, I had that question in my own mind too and wondered about it, but it's a real tough one. Um, that, that's a difficult one. That'd be a great thing for us to get comments on. Yeah, agreed, Luke, good point. Yeah, I'll just, uh, this one, I'll just make a general comment about, I had said something about the original order where uh, it, we concluded, or the commission concluded that for the E value, it should be the higher of the social cost of carbon or the tier one rec value. It was not, it, it, the reference to the social cost of carbon was not any social cost of carbon that staff might want to pick. It was specific to the commission approved social cost of carbon as was uh, explicitly defined in the DCE framework order, which has still not yet been changed. So, um, and, and I refer you to Carl's remarks about the DEC guidance document. So staff does not have the leeway to just adopt the DEC uh, social cost of carbon, which is more than double uh, the, the commission authorized social cost of carbon. That is a decision that would have to be made by the commission. All right, well, thank you. I think it's time to wrap up here. Um, uh, I'm very impressed by the showing. We had over 400 people participating. We're down to 303 now, which means everyone stayed through to the end. Uh, most people did. So again, um, appreciate your participation. Thank you from everybody. Uh, and again, we plan on working with you through this. I know timing isn't always what uh, it needs to be, but it is what it has to be sometimes. And we're working uh, you know, our best to get through this in, in the quickest manner, but also in a manner that allows for the process to take place the way it needs to take place. Um, so I really appreciate everyone's participation. Again, I wanna thank Doreen and John uh, with their opening remarks at the very beginning and Carl and Luke for all the work you did in this and Warren for answering all the DPS cited questions. So I uh, appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna pause there and, and give anyone else on our side an opportunity to say something. I know Doreen, you might still be on. I'm not sure if you wanted to say something to wrap this up or not. Well, thanks, David. Uh, I've just been listening um, to all of this at work. Um, certainly lots, lots to resolve, lots of complexities um, that I'm internalizing here. And um, I would consider this a great starting point, uh, certainly as we as we kick off this this next phase of, of the program. So um, other than my thanks, that's it. Uh, but thank you, not only to the everyone listening, but but the entire NYSERDA and DPS teams. Uh, very well done. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. We're going to wrap this up. Um, have a nice week and uh, we'll talk to you on May 7th. Take care.